we're continuing our discussion with Rodney Watson and we're going to now move on to talking about being on boards because in the break while we move venues, we actually started that discussion so we better have it while it's being recorded <laughs> rather than just between us. The issue, I guess, for those that are listening is the consideration of whether they should think about putting themselves up for being on the board and where to start and what is the progression once they have started that process. Well, I think there are, there's two issues to seriously consider. First of all, whether you want to be, whether you think it would be good to be on a board just because it will progress your career going from a volunteer board to a paid role on a board, or whether or not you are genuinely interested in assisting in the development and the strategic growth of an organisation, and that's whether it's a sporting organisation, Wheels on Wheels, or any of the myriad of volunteer not-for-profit sector boards. And every one of those not-for-profit sector boards has its own niche in which it can offer you something, but more importantly, what you can give to it. One of the things that I find that being on the netball board, because it's associated with sport and that's my bent, is that it gives me the opportunity to contribute to, in a strategic sense, to the growth of sport. And sport I see as being absolutely critical to the health of the nation in terms of healthy lifestyles. And it fits within the government's overall sphere of combating obesity and all of those other things that we've spoken about earlier in terms of development of youth or, or in people and generally. So I think if you consider that and then say, look, I want to contribute, there's two ways to start. It's either wherever you're involved if it's in sport is through probably through a club level to begin with find out from your club, even if you do 12 months or so volunteering on a club, there is always a role for you in some form or another in your club where you probably know that sport more intimately than just picking a sport, drawing one out of the hat and say, oh, I'll have a go at that. That doesn't work. Because when people are elected to boards itself, it's the membership that elects those people to the board. And they're pretty savvy. They understand and they know full well whether the person has got the appropriate skills and background to contribute or whether they are there for themselves. There's two roles. Are you going to be there for the sport or for the business? Or are you going to be there just to progress yourself? If you're going to be there for the latter, just to progress yourself, don't bother because you won't get elected anyway. One of the greatest things of being on a board, it's the opportunity to influence change. It's the opportunity to contribute and the satisfaction of knowing that our sport is in good hands. That comes about usually through a health report from either the Australian Sports Commission or the Office of Sport New South Wales in my case. Obviously with other not-for-profit sector boards, you can find out a lot of those either through the, there's a website dealing with all of that or else go to your local council and find out because many of those are run through local government etc and that's quite important. Governance is absolutely paramount wherever you come from and wherever you sit. You must have an effective constitution, it must be easy to read, it must be easy to understand, it must be in plain English, it must be relevant and contemporary. The most important part of all of this is having that governance, that constitution and your rules, you must widely publish them. And this is all the role of the board. The board is there to set the strategic direction, they set the policy, they set the rules, they approve the budget. But then the implementation of all of that is done by your organisation. And there must be a clear separation. It's therefore in volunteer organisations quite important that the CEO or general manager is not a member of the board. 
They attend the board meetings and give advice when requested, but must not be a member of the board because then you have blurred lines of responsibility. In more recent years, the Australian Sports Commission has taken a very, very strong role pardon me, in terms of governance of our sports and they look at every sport regularly to see whether or not they are complying and meeting all of those governance roles. They have put out seven major principles and I would encourage anyone who's interested in sitting on a board to have a look at that from the Australian Sports Commission website. In doing so, those principles apply to any board not for profit and to a lesser extent to those that are for profit because it's very clear any board you must have an independence of judgment, you must be fully aware of all of the facts, you must seek all of the information and if a CEO does not want to give you any information then you insist to get it because every board director is entitled to see any document and look at any document on a confidential basis. That goes to your decision making. One of the other things that I've done in terms of maintaining relevance on the board so that we can come back to making strategic decisions is maintaining a connection with the grassroots of the sport because it's those people that are down at the grassroots level who play every Saturday, who go to the training every week, who also play other sports, who can turn around and let you know what works and what doesn't work at a far better level and a far more intimate level than if you just sit in your little boardroom and try and work out or think about what might be good or what might not be good. It's a bit like the, the um, Chinese whispers of information. If, you, if information is coming from the playing group or the coaching group or the managing group at that club level and it's passed up through all of those levels before it gets to the board at a statewide level, how much of the information is filtered out before you actually get to see it. So you really do need to be aware of the situation. That's exactly right, and I'm probably taking it one step further, whether any information gets filtered up mm. or whether it's kept down at that level because there's not those open lines of communication to, for people to find out just exactly how something works. You might, as part of your strategic direction, decide to implement a new policy or a new area of work only to find out after three months that it's a dud. Yeah. Now, unless you're down at the grassroots level also, you won't know that. Because you won't know why. You won't yeah. know why, and you'll know people will not say, oh, no, it's fine, yeah. because, but they're not doing it right. But clearly, you've got to get down. You've got to get your hands dirty and find out. But you also must be very, sure, very appropriately informed to make sure that you also separate what you get from the grassroots roots yeah. is in terms of strategic thinking and in terms of development and not day-to-day -day management issues. So if, for people who are thinking about putting themselves up for boards, whether it's voluntary or, or otherwise, do they do a, an analysis of their skills and decide these are the skills that I've got to offer an organisation and, but then match it up with what they think the organisation needs? Or do they just go in and say, well, here I am, I'm very good at numbers, I'm very good at writing yeah. policy, you need me. Uh, how do they go about actually matching what they yeah. see as their skills and what they want to contribute from their skill set to an organisation that might or might not necessarily yeah. need them? There's two or three aspects to that. The first one is quite clearly, yes, they need to research the organisation, look at it, and say, well, what's my skill set? And this is what their basic role is. I would then contact a board director sitting on that board and have a chat with them, the president if pref or the chairperson, preferably. I actually sit on a nominations panel 
for Netball New South Wales as one of my subsidiary roles. And when we're at, it's time for election for vacancies, we call for nominations, but we also put out a skill matrix in terms of what skills we believe need to be come onto the board, yeah. what we are lacking, or what we've got let them know what we've got plenty of. Obviously at the time that positions are advertised, and that's always practically only by website would you pick that up. So you need to be vigilant in looking at, at websites, etc., of your various areas that you're interested in. But certainly when that nominations panel uh, puts out its uh, notice of election, it will let you know what type of skills are required. I guess that in terms of the other, if you just want to make a general inquiry, have a bit of a research through, do some internet research, etc. From time to time also, some boards have what they call as associate directors, and you could send in something because associate director is for one where they, the board will say, look, we've got in succession planning some vacancies coming up in the next time because most boards now there is a limit on the number right. of years you can serve on the board and they might say we had two directors or three directors retiring in the next 12 months this person has expressed an interest in coming onto our board and has this school set we can appoint them as an associate director they can come to the board meetings as an observer for the next yeah. six months or nine months yeah. and see a, whether they like it and it suits, and B, whether the board themselves thinks that person will make an effective contribution. And I think that that's a great way forward because so often do we find people, we, we don't get lots of people applying for volunteer board director positions because it costs you money to be on them. Right. You don't get paid, yeah. so yeah. you know they've got yeah. to know that they are making a volunteer contribution, yes. and that's why that must happen. This is really useful because I get a lot of inquiries or a lot of people in very senior positions who had a, a great corporate life and they transitioning to retirement, yeah. but they want to contribute yeah. a volunteer on yeah. volunteer basis to continue to be connected adding value and using their brains. Yes. To me, that's a great way, the way you describe the options of how to look at it, how to come in. I think it's going to yeah. help a lot of people. There. I can't say strongly enough that if you want to be on a sport board, you mm. really do need to understand yes. the grassroots and the structure underneath yes. the board and how that feeds in. Yeah. Because quite clearly on our Netball New South Wales board we have a mix of skills yes. and we have two appointed directors who really have no netball grassroots experience as such oh. but the rest of the board do. do. I think that in any sport board for it to be effective you've got to have that background in that sport yeah. I mean, the majority of the board needs to have that background in that sport. Mm -hmm. I think there's also very much a role for appointed directors yes. whereby they may bring incredible expertise in terms of digital and media mm -hmm. or expertise. Your current board may be lacking audit and risk yes. background yes. and that would be, for a corporate person, yes. an ideal if they're yes. a chief operating officer That's in an right. organisation. Now, or something legal. Like, there's all those yeah. things because all of those skills are that skill set yeah. across that wide range matrix is now required yes. on every board. Yeah. But also even like things that we don't think about. If you've got a marketing background, for example, yeah. and the passion for that particular sport and you followed it as a yeah. person of interest with it, like whether it's your child gone through it or you've got yeah. a little athletics or whatever right the way through. Just how much you can give in that sense will be fabulous. Oh, yeah. Marketing is a classic example. Yes. We have, within New South Wales, the two Suncorp Super Netball teams, the New South Wales Swifts and yes. Giants Netball. Yes. 
marketing for them, yes. and that's done by our organisation, right. is critical. Yes. And to have a board director yes. who has those immense skills would be yes. a wonderful thing to have because mm. they can set, set strategic direction in marketing. Yes. They know that outside marketplace, yes. and that is so important mm. with how we operate mm. at that higher level these days, yes. you have to operate in corporate Australia. Mm. And that means sponsorship, marketing mm. of the product, marketing yeah. of the game, and getting fans yeah. and all of that thing. So, to increase yeah. the interest in a sport yep. and get people young like you do in your organisation, yep. we're just trying to get new blood and show yep. them interest. Netball has grown a lot. I mean, women sports, yep. that was new. You talked about hockey introduction, yep. you talked about netball and how you actually contribute to that. Not many people can say that. And to us, a lot of them, we think, I wish they will. But I never, you never look at it and say, how can I? And you've done it. And this is really live experience for us. That leads me into the next little bit that yeah. I want to talk about because yes. what we didn't get to in the awards that Rodney has received oh, yes. is that Rodney that? was yeah. awarded the Order of Australia. So he's our first guest with an OAM, so we're making a big fuss about it. <laughs> Yay. But what I want to ask, and obviously, as you will all have heard, it, it is just recognition for all of the work that he has put in over the many, many, many years to sport at from the grassroots level all the way to the, the senior management of the sport. But I, what I want to ask is, is more on a personal level is, did you have an inkling that you had been, you'd been submitted, your name had been submitted, and what did you think when the letter arrived? Firstly, I had no idea that anything that I had ever been nominated for this award, and that's obviously nominated by your peers from whatever community you're in. When I got the letter from the Prime Minister's Department or the Secretary to the Governor General, which said, you have been nominated to um, receive this award, but before we proceed further, we want to know if you will accept it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and of course, in saying this, the words confidential were forced. <laughs> so you, you couldn't discuss it even with your mother, your wife, your, yeah. your, your partner. Your, and it's quite a long time, whatever. six weeks or so. Yeah, oh, it was it? more than that. It was, it was in October, early October. Oh, wow. And it wasn't announced in January. 2015, and oh. it was announced in, for the Australia Day Honours 2016. So for three months or more, yeah. you have to, and you have to respond within an appropriate period right. of time. And then you just sort of sit back and twiddle your thumbs and until the what announcement happened? happens in 2016. And my award was for my contribution to netball in an administrative role. As I say, this comes back, I suppose, what's been my bent is in the, the governance of netball, etc. Notwithstanding the fact that I still do go out and umpire. I think it's important <laughs> too that if you can keep contributing in any way at that local grassroots level. It just means you have a greater connection, you maintain yes. that connection. Yeah. But as, it was an absolute result, honour. Yeah, as a result of receiving that award, have you seen renewed... You know, has there been some sort of follow-on in terms of the organisation? Have you seen renewed interest in people wanting to volunteer? Have you seen... You know, just? Has there been a, a reaction to that recognition on a broader um, scale? I guess that yeah, there was a, a reaction towards me by hundreds of people in, in congratulating me on, yeah. on the receipt of the award. It's quite humbling and, and quite incredible because you don't go we into these roles. We all want to be associated with someone famous. <laughs> <laughs> we don't go into those roles with a view of, of getting an award. No. And so when something like this yeah. happens, it, it is quite humbling and it, it, it's a wonderful recognition. But in terms of, do you think it's to any more, uh, um, got more people to contribute? Probably not, because overall you get an award for what you personally have put in without going out and saying to someone, look, if you come on and do all of this volunteer work, you'll get an award. You might get an, you award. Might get yeah. an award. Yeah. We don't That's, operate like no. that. You have to want to volunteer. 
but to me that award is is a is appreciation for people like yourself who actually put that time in and i think we should do that because sometimes we forget to thank people you're yeah. absolutely right you know we have a series in, in new south wales of of thanking people much of it by certificate level yes. etc and that sort of thing yeah. but where we do for people who have served in a volunteer capacity in their clubs throughout the entire state of New South Wales mm. for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 yeah. they get awards and then those who have done 40 years or more and there are many particularly in country areas mm. etc they are nominated and received by us and unfortunately you can only do one a year uh, so we've still got a lot to catch up. They get an award from the state government right. at the state government awards night, sports awards night, and associations themselves. Like, for instance, when I said the Penrith Service Award, we do five of those a year, up to five a year. Yeah. And so they're the sorts of... That's the start of it, I suppose. Yeah. The culmination, obviously, was in my OAM. But it, it's something that you do without consideration of recognition. It's something you do because you love being involved with the sport. And you get out of the sport yourself personally all of those things along the way of saying, oh, I was involved in that decision-making. Oh, I'm watching that player. And I guess a classic example is when I did get my OAM, I got a message from a former player who played for Penrith in state league and also represented New South Wales at at the national championships and played for the Sydney Swifts and at the time I sent her back a message she sent sent me a message of congratulations and I sent her back a message saying oh thanks very much but I really didn't expect so to receive such a, a, a glowing thing from you and she said well you were important to me. Mm. Mm. She said, you mentored me. Yeah. She said, when I was a player and I didn't get selected in my first state team, you sat me down and encouraged me to keep going. And so they remember that. Yeah, yeah. 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 and you yeah. made a big difference to her career and life yes. and passion. And there is no price for that. I mean, like, yeah. you can never pay you to feel no. like that. It's well, I do. felt good that she got in. Yeah. And she went on to be a great representative. Yeah, was some, that was my reward and satisfaction yeah. for me, uh, just yeah. to see that happen. And each time when we, when I spoke to various players yes. and athletes and umpires, etc., yeah. to see them progress, that was a great reward. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they came back and said that to me afterwards, I thought, well, you know, that's even greater. Beautiful. We're going to uh, call a halt now so that we can go and enjoy some lunch. <laughs> So we do thank Rodney for spending the time with us and sharing so much of his experience and his expertise with us. For now, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fiona Osborne. We've been talking to Rodney Watson, OAM. This is Inside Exec.